I have an idea, and the idea is that all of us ought to give up on the notion that we have to obey the Constitution of the United States. Now, <laughs> there is one, <laughs> there's one problem with this idea, and that is that nobody agrees with it. Um, liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, blue state and red state, Obama and Ted Cruz, the Boston Red Sox and the, the uh, uh, Cardinals, they all agree that this idea is not only wrong, it's stupid, it's dumb, it's dangerous, and it's evil. So I'm really quite proud that in this age of partisan meltdown, I've been able to bring the country together like this. <laughs> but um, to say the least, this is kind of a heavy lift, convincing people that this is the right thing to do. So at the very least, I hope you guys give me a degree of difficulty points for this. Um, but you know what? If you think about it for a minute, the people who really bear the burden of proof are the people who think we ought to obey the Constitution. So what we're talking about is the oldest Constitution in the world. It's also the most difficult to amend. Um, it was written at a time when the United States was a tiny rural republic huddled along the eastern seaboard, largely supported by slave labor. Um, the people who wrote it knew nothing about industrialization or the internet or the war on terror or the National Football League. They'd never heard of um, Bill Gates or Albert Einstein or Ad Adolf Hitler or Lady Gaga. Um, these were people who knew nothing of our present country. Um, so why on earth ought we to treat their beliefs, their hopes, their ideas, their obsessions as our own? It just seems really nuts. Um, here's another way to put it. Let's suppose for the moment that you were the President of the United States or a Supreme Court Justice. I know at least one person in the audience is going to be a Supreme Court Justice or um, a member of Congress or just a really concerned citizen. And you had a really important issue of public policy that you had to decide. And you're a careful, responsible person, so you're going to spend some time studying this, right? And you'll talk to um, people who uh, are experts. Maybe you'll talk to social scientists and figure out exactly what the effect of this is going to be. Maybe you would talk to uh, philosophers or theologians and think about what the, the morality and ethics of it is. Um, and eventually, after really careful thought and a lot of consultation, you decide. And let's just suppose you decide to do X. Then, right at the moment you're about to do X, somebody comes running into the room and they say, wait a second, wait a second, don't do it yet. I've got something really important to tell you. What's that? Well, people who died over 200 years ago, and who, by the way, thought it was perfectly fine to own other human beings, and thought that women had no role to play in public affairs, and thought that the only people who should be allowed to vote are white male property owners, those people think the right thing to do is not X. And then, just because those people think not X is the right thing to do, you say, oh, sorry. I'm going to change my mind. Let's do not X. Pardon me, but you'd have to have your head examined if that's what you did. Now, um, all of this has been very abstract. Why don't we talk about some specifics? Let's talk about guns. So my wife, my friends, my kids, my 33 and 30-year-old 30 kids, um, they can't believe it. but. I'm actually quite skeptical about most forms of gun control. Now, don't misunderstand. I, I hate guns. I would never own a gun. I think we'd be much better off if there were no guns in the United States. But there happen to be 300 million in the United States, and I'm doubtful that we're going to be able to do anything about it. And I think probably the cost of regulation is more than it's worth. 
But you know, I understand there are very, very smart people who disagree with me, and so I like to debate this, and you know, somebody might change my mind. But here's one way not to hold the debate, and that's to start talking about the Second Amendment, right? So now, instead of talking about um, guns uh, and whether we ought to have them, we're talking about whether it's constitutional to have them. And once you start talking that way, two very bad things happen in a big hurry. First, instead of talking about things that matter, what the effect of guns is now and what we could do about them, instead we start talking about what in the 18th century the framers meant by the word militia, um, or what exactly the relationship is between the uh, operative clause and the clause about well-regulated militias, or what exactly the relationship is between the Second Amendment and the English Bill of Rights. Now, don't get me wrong, I do this for a living, so I, I enjoy doing it, but that's a really stupid way of talking about the issue. In other words, it, it, it distracts us from what we ought to be talking about. But that's not the worst effect. The worst effect is, as soon as you start talking about the Constitution, people start raising their voices. And instead of talking calmly, they're yelling at each other. And why? Because now we're not just talking about a question of policy. You and I can disagree about policy and still be friends. Now, all of a sudden, someone is accusing us of rejecting the foundational document of the United States rejecting what it means to be an American. And people don't take that lying down. And so what we see more and more in our society is not people engaging about public policy questions like people have done all day today, but people shouting at each other. And that's just not good for our democracy. Now, I know what you're thinking. I can see out there all of these idea balloons over your heads. And what you're thinking is, yeah, but what about civil liberties? How, if, if we didn't have a constitution, what would prevent the president from locking up his political opponents? Or isn't Seidman at all worried about chaos? If we didn't have a constitution, how would we know how long a president served? Or for that matter, how, how would we know whether we had a president? Well, here's one very important point to understand. Saying that we don't have an obligation to obey the Constitution doesn't mean that we should automatically do the opposite of everything that's in the Constitution. Um, it turns out the framers had some pretty good ideas. Um, certainly uh, the protections of freedom of speech, of liberty, of equality. Those are things we ought to do not because they thought we ought to do them and not because they're in a document in the National Archives, but because they're good ideas. Unfortunately, they also had some really lousy ideas. So it's not a good idea to um, have the three people who live in Wyoming have two senators for themselves, while the 38 million people in California also have two senators. Um, it's not a good idea to, to get closer to home, literally. It's not a good idea that the residents of the District of Columbia have no say in electing the people who rule them. Uh, it's not a good idea that somebody can become president of the United States, uh, even though a majority of the voters voted for somebody else. Those are really bad ideas, and to the extent they're bad ideas, they ought to be on the table, and we ought to think about changing them. So, um, now, there were some other things in the Constitution that really aren't good or bad ideas, or maybe they're slightly bad ideas, but on balance, uh, it probably makes more sense to continue doing things the way we have for a long time than having a fight over them. So I don't think it's a good idea, for example, to have an argument every time the president's term is up about how long his term ought to be. Uh, that's not going to work very well. And so we shouldn't do it just because it doesn't work very well. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, they don't have a written constitution. They can change things by statute. 
But um, we know that at the end of a parliamentary term, they don't argue every time about how long the term of parliament is. Uh, and there's no reason why we would have to do that. But you know what? The best argument for why uh, constitutional disobedience won't produce chaos and it won't produce a collapse of civil liberties is that we actually have some experience with this. Um, it turns out throughout most of our history, most of our most important and revered leaders have believed in and engaged in constitutional disobedience. Now, this is not something you learn in your civics courses, but it's really important. Let, let's just take some examples. Well, why don't we start at the very beginning? Let's talk about George Washington. George Washington presided at the Constitutional Convention. One of the first things that he and the other people, the other founders who were there decided was that they were going to violate the Constitution. The Constitution in place then was the Articles of Confederation. And here's a deep irony. The Constitution of the United States is itself unconstitutional because they decided with no warrant and no authority from anyone that they were going to disobey the terms that the Articles of Confederation set for how to amend them or change them. And why did they do that? They did it because they thought it was best for the country and they were probably right. What about Thomas Jefferson? The most important act Thomas Jefferson took during his administration was the purchase of Louisiana. Not Louisiana, the Louisiana Territory. Big section of the United States today. It's hard to imagine what the country would be like without it. Um, well, here's an amazing fact. Thomas Jefferson himself thought that the Louisiana Purchase was unconstitutional. In fact, he, he was so convinced of this that he started to write a constitutional amendment to get it adopted. But it turned out that France was about to back out of the deal, so he had to act quickly. So what did he do? He went ahead even though he thought it was unconstitutional. And at the end of his life, he defended that because he said his obligation was to do what was best for the country. And this was best for the country. Some of the greatest heroes in American history were the abolitionists who, before the Civil War, fought for the abolition of slavery. Um, again, something that is not often in, in our civics books. The Constitution pretty clearly protected slavery. And that's why many of the abolitionists said so much the worse for the Constitution. Uh, abolitionists like uh, uh, William Lloyd Garrison um, publicly burned the Constitution and denounced that it's a pact with the devil. Um, Frederick Douglass argued that because of the Constitution, the North ought to secede from the South. And what about Abraham Lincoln? What about Abraham Lincoln? I think the greatest act in American history was the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln himself thought and said in the first inaugural that the president and indeed the Congress lacked the power to abolish slavery where it already existed. And he himself said that it was unconstitutional even as a military matter to do that. But you know what? He did it. He did it. And when slavery ended in this country, the reason it ended was not because of the Constitution. The Constitution prevented ending it for several generations. It was ended because Abraham Lincoln was brave enough to end it and because the United States was willing to fight a war to end it that killed over 700,000 people. I could go on. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, all those people were um, skeptics about the Constitution. So constitutional disobedience is as American as apple pie. Now, what are we going to do about this? What's our action plan to change the idea that we have to obey the Constitution? This is not going to come about by some sudden legal change. The Supreme Court's not suddenly going to announce something. No, what has to happen is there has to be a cultural change. And the way cultural change happens is 
one conversation at a time until there are hundreds of thousands of conversations. That's a, a lot of the way that, for example, women's liberation made progress. So here's something that you can do just immediately. The next time you hear somebody say, that's unconstitutional, you can respond with a deeply subversive two-word question. So what? <laughs> now, you might want to talk a little longer. And <laughs> after the person punches you in the nose when you get back up again, um, here's what you might say. Look, the United States is our country. It belongs to us. We live here. We have the responsibility to make it the best country we can, and we have the right to. Nobody would say the United States should be ruled by France. Nobody would say it should be ruled by the United Nations. And nobody should say that it should be ruled by men who died 225 years ago. In the end, the most important three words of the Constitution are the first three words, we the people. And ironically, those three words in the Constitution indicate that we ought to disobey the rest of it. Because what they say when, they, when it says, we the people, they mean we the living people, not they the dead people. <laughs> and we the living people have the right and the obligation, and we ought to have the courage to make our, our country right. And if the framers got it wrong, we ought to say, so much the worse for them. Thank you very much.